Pinterest.com says words have meaning, but names have power. Rankings. This is Locked On Big 12. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Big 12. I'm Drake Toll from ESPN Central Texas. Thank you for making Locked On Big 12 your first listen every single day. Plenty to go through today when you think about how whole oh, Houston's making a move. Baylor's not making a move. There's Oklahoma State and Texas in the Big 12 title. Can the hateful eight resurrect any momentum going into the new Big 12 over Texas and Oklahoma with a win on Saturday? And most importantly on today's show, how about the power Rankings. Number one. Number one of the power rankings is the Texas Longhorns. Gosh, dang it. Every freaking week, guys. Every week. Can nobody... I just want I want somebody else to be good at the football thing or better at the football thing than Texas. And it hasn't happened. Number one. Number two, Oklahoma State. They jumped Oklahoma in the power rankings. I know OU had a dominant win. Oklahoma State had a rally against BYU, but it only felt right that one and two in the power rankings would be the two teams in the Big 12 championship. However, I do believe Oklahoma in legitimate power rankings would probably be number two. But guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I make the rules, my power rankings. Number three, Oklahoma. They're the second best team in the Big 12, second best roster. They lost to Kansas. Ha. Number four, Iowa State. Who would have thought? This is crazy, brother. This is crazy, brother. Who would have thought that Matt Campbell and Iowa State would be number four in the Big 12, number four in the power rankings at the end of the season? I was looking yesterday at a, a list of headlines that I had written down in my notes for like week three of things to talk about on the show. And one of the top headlines was, it's time for Matt Campbell to go at Iowa State. Like, Matt Campbell is in trouble or something. He finishes number four, shocks everybody. Their record is not spectacular. I, I, nobody's riding home uh, or should be riding home about a 7-5 and five season, but it was actually one of the more cool 7-5 and five seasons that I've seen. Matt Campbell, number four. Number five, West Virginia. C.J. Donaldson, Neil Brown, Garrett Green, who's a dog, and Neil Brown's coming back. I didn't have a lot of confidence in West Virginia earlier this season. I said they would go 1-11, and 11, and Neil Brown is going to keep his job. They're not 1-11. and 11. They're going bowling. They're 8-4, and four, one of the best Big 12 teams at number 5. Number 6, I am going to call this season a disappointment for Kansas State, and I don't think you can disagree bringing back Will Howard, having a back like DJ Giddens, having a Ben Sennett, who I believe is the best tight end in the league and could have been a – he should be your, your Travis Kelsey of the Big 12. I, I don't think I'm crazy for saying that. Your team finishes 8-4, and four, number 6 in the Big 12. A disappointing loss to Iowa State where your defense falls apart and, and felt like the offense, when it mattered the most under Colin Klein, just didn't give you exactly what you needed this year in late-game scenarios, that Texas game namely. At number 7, the Kansas Jayhawks. Another team that I didn't have a lot of confidence coming into the year with. I thought they'd finish at five and seven. I know they've been on an upward trajectory with Lance Leipold, but I thought at some point that kind of has to break. You can't erase you know, decades of bad history at KU that quickly. Lance Leipold can. And the disappointing part about Kansas season is they're not going to get the love they deserve. That's a very impressive eight and four. But those four losses came to, came at times where it was, okay, here's where Kansas can, can finally take that next step. They can beat Texas. Well, they didn't. Here's where Kansas can take that next step. They can beat Oklahoma State on the road, a top 25 team, and, and they didn't, or, or a soon to be top 25 team, and they didn't. Or here, oh, oh, can they do? They can beat Texas Tech at home, and then injuries hold them back. Had Kansas stayed healthy, it could have been a different season for the Jayhawks, but they just. They didn't. They didn't stay healthy, and that that hurt them so much. The the Oklahoma win was huge, but when it felt like, oh, oh this is the one that's going to prove Kansas has staying power, they're consistent. They just didn't exactly get it done. Then at number eight. Texas Tech. So your your top half of the Big 12, your top half of the Big 12 going into conference championship week. Number one, Texas. Number two, Oklahoma State. Three, Oklahoma. Four, Iowa State. Five, West Virginia. Six, Kansas State. Seven, Kansas. You all finish in good graces. Number eight, Texas Tech. You're going bowling. That's fun. But guys, you regressed. 
For a head coach that's proven he's so good at recruiting, you can't regress in year two to the point where you're losing by 50 points to Texas. That that's just that yeah, that can't be acceptable, right? There has to be some sort of conversation of, oh, Joey McGuire is a great recruiter, but dude, you're gonna have to put it on the field. You're gonna put it all together on the field, and we can't just have moral victories where we get close and almost win. Despite injuries, even we have to go out and win these football games. McGuire didn't do that this season, Texas Tech at number eight. Number nine, the best of the new guys, UCF. You'll notice we haven't gotten to TCU yet. UCF finishes above a couple of hateful eight teams at number nine, and they're going bowling themselves. I consider this for the injuries that they had to deal with as well, and everybody in the conference did. There are only two quarterbacks, I believe, that weren't benched or taken out due to injury over the course of the season. For them, this is is an impressive way to finish the year. I don't give you an excuse for being six and six. I thought UCF would finish with seven or eight wins based on the schedule they were dealt. And and you should, I mean, you've claimed a national championship. You have a head coach who's won a national championship as an offensive coordinator, been to one as a head coach. You should have been in a better spot than six and six, in my opinion. But you fought through injuries. You got to a bowl. For that, I give you a win. And finishing at number nine is nothing to, to balk at for one of these new teams. Number 10, TCU. It is tough, and it's going to take me a little bit to decide who I believe I'm most disappointed in in this Big 12 season. Who is the one that really uh, that, that didn't stand out most uh, or, or underachieved, I guess is what I'm looking for. And TCU is up there for sure. To finish in the bottom five in the Big 12 after going to the whole ass national championship game, college football playoff, you win a game, and then, man, you end up at number 10. You're not even bowl eligible. Your season's over. Somebody else will play a game at Amon G. Carter in the Armed Forces Bowl, and you're sitting at home at five and seven. That's not great. Number 11, BYU. Oh, for a team that was right there, had an opportunity to not just go to a bowl game, but win eight games in the Big 12, you had to have the dog mentality. And BYU did not have that at the end of the season. You had to have, all right, we're going to keep on grinding. We're going to keep on. We're not going to stop here. We're going to keep going. Doesn't matter injuries. Doesn't matter the run game struggles. We're going to take the hand we're dealt. We're going to take this team that we've been dealt, and we're going to go win football games. And BYU did not do that down the stretch. They finished at 11 behind UCF, but ahead of number 12, Cincinnati. I can't, we can't fire Scott Satterfield because it's his first year, but three and nine, dismal, really bad. There's a gap to me between BYU and the rest of everybody else because these next three are just bad. Cincinnati was just bad every time they went out there. Since he at 12, I don't know. A lot of soul searching in the offseason for a team that was also in the college football playoff not too long ago under Luke Fickle. At number 13, Houston. (sighs) You did the right thing, you know? Mike Pence had the courage. You did the right thing. Fire Dana Holgerson. You got him out of town and you decided you're going to be serious about sports. You're going to be serious about football. And for that, I commend you. It doesn't erase how bad of a season this was. You're still at the bottom of the totem pole in the power rankings. But now with a coaching change, you get to reset. Unlike the team that finishes at 14th. There is a large chasm between 13 and 14. And that large chasm is the depths of hell. And then you get to Baylor University, who not only are they last in the power rankings due to their record this year and how they finished the season, but they're also last in morale. They didn't fire the coach. They went and fired the offensive coordinator who had the number one offense in America at BYU, number three scoring offense or number three in yardage and number one in yards per play. You ruined him. You told him, hey, we have personal player here, Jeff Grimes, so we can't recruit certain kids because they're not good enough people. And hey, you know, we don't have any NIL. We can't really do the portal either. So you just handcuffed Jeff Grimes and asked him to coach here. Then you fired him. Then you fired your DC last season. You hired a guy this year. who You said you can't call plays anymore. And now Dave Aranda gets to be the head coach and their scapegoats who get fired when he didn't do his job and wasn't very good at his job doesn't make a lot of sense to me does it make sense to you no Baylor worst in the Big 12 this season what a colossal disappointment for the Bears in Waco number one Texas two Oklahoma State three Oklahoma four Iowa State five West Virginia six Kansas State seven Kansas that's your top half of the Big 12 at number eight Texas Tech nine UCF 10 the TCU Horn Frogs what a bad season 11 BYU 12 Cincinnati 13 Houston and Baylor at 14 in this week's conference championship game Big 12 power rankings coming up let's talk Big 12 championship game a complete preview of Texas at Oklahoma State this is locked on Big 12 part of the locked on podcast network your team every day today's show is brought to you by game time game time is where I go where I go to get last minute 
tickets. The best deals, too. I was sitting at a Chili's a couple of weeks ago. I'm about to go to a Dallas Stars game. They're playing the Boston Bruins. Does that make any sense to you? It made no sense to me at the time. I'm going with Locked On Baylor host Cameron Stewart. He wanted to take me to a hockey game. We're sitting at Chili's 30 minutes before the game. We had to buy tickets. We go to game time. Game time has last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. Easy to find to buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. You get views from all seats in the venue. Lowest price guaranteed. Event cancellation protection. Job loss protection as well. And right now, you get 110% the difference of a ticket if you find it cheaper somewhere else. In the same section, same row, find it cheaper somewhere else. Game time credits you 110% of the difference. So right now... Go to the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app. If you want cheap tickets, download the Game Time app. Use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. If your first purchase is twenty dollars, those are free tickets. Congrats! Twenty dollars off your first purchase at Locked On College with the Game Time app. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, Texas. Oklahoma State, Big 12 championship game. The line opened at 10. Texas favored by 10. The last I saw it was at 13 and a half. So betters already love the Horns, who just beat Texas Tech 57 to 7 in this game. And we're looking at an Oklahoma State team who a couple of weeks ago got blown off the face of the earth by UCF. Now, that game was in a monsoon and much different weather than it'll be a nice, sunny, 73 degree AT&T Stadium indoors in Arlington. Both of these teams... Both of these teams have had very different paths here. Texas has dominated pretty much everybody, aside from that Oklahoma loss. They have. And uh, as I dominated, you know, there have been a couple close wins down the stretch, but you knew, right? You just kind of knew, like, gosh, dang it. You're waiting for them to trip up like they usually do, but they're the best team in the Big 12. They're likely going to the Big 12 championship, and it's exactly what's happening. And then Oklahoma State, it was, oh, they lost to South Alabama. They might go 3-9 and nine and fire Mike Gundy. Instead... They're going to the Big 12 championship. Now, Texas has not been in this game since 2018. There's nobody on the roster that remembers what it's like to play in this one. They played in big games. They've been to Tuscaloosa, but this is a championship game. The biggest game Texas has played in since 2018. For Oklahoma State, they have guys who have been there and have a bitter taste in their mouth from when they lost to Baylor in that dramatic, awful fashion where Baylor just somehow stopped Oklahoma State defensively at the goal line. For the Cowboys, they're averaging 30 points per game. The offense has not been a huge issue. 272 pass yards per game for a guy like Alan Bowman. For Texas, they only have 12 more passing yards than that each game. Like That is that is huge. And Oklahoma State has been able to rely more on the passing game in the last few weeks. Remember that one time that Ollie Gordon was scoring four or five touchdowns every week, which he did last week, by the way. But he was doing it every week. And Oklahoma State could really only run the football because they had three different quarterbacks that didn't know who to trust. And they decided on Alan Bowman, and he wasn't that good. So what do we do now? We hand the ball to Ollie Gordon, who we were handing the ball to earlier in the year. Well, now the passing game has developed. Alan Bowman is still not a great quarterback. He is just okay. You're going to have to run the football, but at least he's a little bit better. And Texas secondary is where you can try to expose the Longhorns. They, they allow 258 yards per game passing. That is mediocre. They only allow 17 points per game. They score 35 points per game. I told you they've mostly dominated their opponents this season. For Oklahoma State, what do you have to do? You're going to have to find a way. Find a way to establish the run game against a team that doesn't allow opposing teams to run the ball. Texas only allows 85 rush yards per game. Now, look. Texas is missing Jonathan Brooks. He's out for the year. But then here comes C.J. Baxter, who's been so good for them. And I, I, it's like... That is that is how you know a team is actually good is because when their best player goes down or somebody key goes down, they just throw in somebody else who looks just as solid. And then when Baxter went down last week, Texas was still able to run the football against Texas Tech. You're going to have to, as Oklahoma State, not rely on taking advantage of injuries because that's not going to happen. Even with with te- and Texas has been banged up. You know, Malik Murphy got banged up, and Arch Manning was the the two last week. And Quinn Ewers has missed some time. And again, mentioned the Jonathan Brooks injury. But from Ad Mitchell to Xavier Worthy to the weapons Texas has offensively to Byron Murphy and the big defensive line and the defense that's just going to push you back. I just if this game is going to be won in the trenches. It's going to take a heroic performance from an Oklahoma State offensive and defensive line that I don't, that I know that aren't as good as what Texas puts on the field. For Oklahoma State, there aren't a lot of stakes. 
you could say, oh, you know, this is there's huge stakes. This is your chance at the first Big 12 championship in the in the in the conference championship game era. But no, the, the stakes are with Texas. They're the team that needs this so badly. They need to rub it into everybody else. They're good again going into the SEC. For Oklahoma State, your stakes are simply upsetting the big dog, are simply making them sad. That's what I need from you. Can you do it? Can you do it? Find a way to establish the run with Ollie Gordon. If you can do that, if you can run for 100 yards in the first half, that's going to open up the passing game. That's where Oklahoma State can beat Texas. I don't trust Alan Bowman. I'm going to need for 60 minutes him to just be stupid good to keep Texas away from its first Big 12 championship since 2009. Texas is the best team in the Big 12. It's really not that close. They have the most athletes. Quinn Ewers has been so um, smart. He has been opportunistic and smart. He's not the best quarterback in the Big 12. He has not been the flashiest quarterback in the Big 12, but he hasn't needed to be. He's not a Heisman contender. He hasn't needed to be. Xavier Worthy is there to... to uh, Xavier Worthy is right there to help him out. Oh, Andy Mitchell's right there to help him out. The keys, the offensive weapons, the offensive line that Texas has has been stupid, stupid good. But I've across the way, 1,500 yards rushing, 21 touchdowns for Ollie Gordon. Get the ball to Ollie Gordon. If he rushes for 100 yards in the first half and Brendan Presley can open up, then you can find a way to get Alan Bowman involved. If the defense, if your Colin Oliver can step up and make a big play, if a Nicholas Martin can step up and make a big play, then then you've got a shot. Then you've got a shot. Look, you beat Oklahoma. Oklahoma beat Texas. Oklahoma State beat Oklahoma and Oklahoma beat Texas. I know the transit property does not work. It does not work in college football. But Texas struggled with Iowa State, struggled with TCU, struggled with K-State, overlooking the 57-7 to win. If Oklahoma State can channel what they did against OU and maybe get a call or two from the officials, there's a way. There's a way. As you can see, I'm trying to convince myself. Please. Please. Coming up, Baylor keeps Dave Aranda, Houston Fires, Dana Holkerson. Who is the serious one here? This is Locked On Big 12, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, where I go to make money. You want $150 in free play? Go to FanDuel right now. FanDuel.com forward slash locked on. I do buy do bets. I do player props. I do spreads. I do money lines, over-unders, all at FanDuel. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning money line bet. Put $5 on the money line for Texas this week or for Oklahoma State. You get $150. In bonus bets, it's 150 bucks if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options. FanDuel.com forward slash lock on to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. It's a quick, short coaching update. Today, as Houston has announced, it will fire Dana Holgerson. Chris Pesman and company say we want to be serious about our standing in the Big 12 moving forward and a lackluster four and eight this season is not going to get it done in the new Big 12. The, the stark contrast of that is Baylor going three and nine and announcing that it will, well, sources, Pete Thamel saying Baylor will retain Dave Aranda as the head coach. Let's start on the Dave Aranda and Baylor side. I'll move into Houston and some possible coaching candidates over there. Houston just got to this league and went four and eight. Baylor has been in the Big 12 for decades and went three and nine, a worse record, a more lackluster season and said, yeah, we can keep doing this. Uh, That's all right. Let's let's stick it out for a second with a coach with a coach who has lost the fan base. People are not showing up to games. People do not care about the games. You're going to lose season ticket holders. You're going to lose faith in an organization, faith in a program. And to me, say right now, to me, this is a career decision for Mac Rhodes. If Baylor goes three and nine, four and eight next year, that is the end of the line for Mac Rhodes and his staff. You are betting your your job as an athletic director on a coach who was three and nine. You're sticking your neck out to say, okay, we're going to bring him back. We're going to do it. And to me, That A, it's a very unserious thing to do. It shows that Baylor's okay with being so far behind the punch in the new Big 12 that you're just getting walloped week in and week out. And even more so, it says, hey, as an athletic director, I'm going to put my faith and trust in a guy who has not won really anything in the last couple of years. And it's been so bad that recruiting is in the bottom 60 of the country or being out recruited by random FC, you know, random group of five teams. And we're going to stick with that. And and look, there are reported changes coming to the staff or, you know, off the field that NIL is going to get better for Baylor. 
Dude, you, are you going to fire the offensive coordinator who replaced the offensive coordinator that you fired? Are you going to fire the defensive coordinator that replaced the defensive coordinator that you fired? You can't keep firing coordinators as if that's going to be the, the fix. Now, you know what? We'll fire this guy. We'll fire this guy. We'll fire this. At some point, it's the head coach. You can't just keep, well, that coordinator wasn't a good fit. Otherwise, we would have won. Or this this coordinator who I who I thought would be a good fit for the guy that I already fired, he, we, we couldn't win with him, so we're going to fire him. That's not how this goes. At some point, it's the head coach who has to answer for why a team sucks, for why a team is terrible. And now the AD has gone out and said this coach, whose team was terrible, whose team sucked, is coming back. Despite everything pointing to him not being prepared to be a, a, a recruiter, an NIL curator, a transfer portal expert. Dave Aranda cannot do those things. He has proven that to you. You don't need to see anything else. He's proven it to you. And Baylor says, all right, you know what? We're a person over player. We're a culture place. We're good with losing. That's fine. That's good. As long as we just, you know, we got, we got to keep everybody and make sure everybody's being nice. You know, we, we got to. We look, we're, we're the biggest Baptist university in the world. Come on, guys. We can lose a little bit because, you know, three and nine's fine. We're just going to still be the biggest Baptist university in the world. That's what you, that's the message you're portraying to fans who are not going to pay to show up to continue to see what Dave Aranda put on the field last season. Then for Houston, it's the opposite. Look, we've been considered a little brother in Texas in the new Big 12 going four and eight. People still think we're a little brother. There needs to be a change. We're not going to wait around to find out whether or not it's going to work out. Baylor's going to wait around to find out whether or not a guy who's under 500 in four years is going to work out. That's unserious. Houston says, we've been looked at, we've been scoffed at, but we've had a lot of success in the last decade. We've had head coaches that were poached by much larger programs like A&M, like Texas. We need to go out and find that guy again. Dana Holgerson out. Now who's in? I think a guy like G.J. Kinney at Texas State would be great. I'm not sure. I know Houston's a power five school now, but I'm not sure Jeff Trailer would immediately jump at the idea of going to Houston if he has other big teams that have their name in the hat or have his name in their hat. I don't think he's going to Texas A&M. I don't think that they would want that. Although, if they did, if he did, they'd win a whole lot of football games. Maybe there comes a point in a week or two where Houston's on the table, Jeff Trailer's ready for a move to the Power Five, and that's the one that works out the most. The old Gilmer guy stays in Texas. Could see it, but that that's that's you're asking a lot. Jeff Trailer's one of the hottest names in college football right now. Wait and see if he balks at some of the schools that are bigger than Houston who will have coaching vacancies. If he does, and Houston lands Jeff Trailer, that's massive. But maybe even more massive to me, truly, I think maybe even more massive for a Houston, a better fit for a Houston, G.J. Kenny at Texas State. Immediate roster turnover, immediate coaching staff turnover. Everywhere he has gone, he has won. The guy just doesn't lose. He just simply does not lose. He is a Texas high school football um legend or comes from a legendary Texas high school football coaching tree with his father. He's got ties to the Big 12 as a guy whose brother played at Baylor, whose dad's a big Baylor guy, whose family's a big Baylor family. And Baylor, not taking the opportunity to hire somebody else or hire him or go anywhere else, you don't have to worry about them possibly poaching a candidate. You go, you go get G.J. Kenny, who just beat the Bears in Waco, and you start beating the Bears in Waco. That, And I know it's maybe you're, you're sitting at home, you're going, I want to talk about Baylor here. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good litmus test. It's a good as long as Houston stays above Baylor in the new Big Twelve. That's that's a, a mark of success. That hey, we are doing better than a team that's been in, in this league for decades. If we can beat out at least one of those original Big Twelve teams. That's huge. And Baylor seems to be that punching bag that Houston lean on to say, hey, we're better than this school who's been Power Five for so long. If I'm Houston, GJ Kinney, I've got him on the phone. Um, you know, Rhett Lashley, if you can make a, a, a huge splash, it would be a huge splash just to pull a guy who's going to the ACC away from SMU. It's just a big middle finger to everybody over there and a big middle finger to the ACC, honestly. For Houston, Chris Pesman, you said, I, we are tired of, this is not it. We are tired of losing. And this, this is, there's not an experiment here. There's not a, oh, we give him another year, see what happens. No, we're committed to winning. That's big. For Baylor, it's not a commitment to winning. It's a commitment to maybe this experiment will work out. You had four years to confirm your hypothesis. Four years to confirm your hypothesis. The experiment is over. It didn't work. And you're sticking with a guy who's already fired an OC, who's already fired a DC. He can't keep firing coordinators. At some point, it's him. He can't do NIL. He can't do transfer portal. 
He can't. He just told you in his last press conference he can't do an IL. He can't be a head coach. He said, I, I, don't, you know, I don't feel right giving the quarterback more money than the backup DB. He said, I don't feel right staggering the money. Great. Then you're not fit to be a boss. It's just the way it works. Houston, very serious. Congratulations. You've decided you want to win. Baylor, very unserious. Not surprising, very unserious if you stick with this regime. I think there are a lot of great pieces on the in the assistant coaching staff as well. I think there are assistant coaches on this staff that would be good head coaches in college football. There's a reason those are, those murmurs exist about a guy like Jeff Grimes. There's a reason Matt Powell was the D.C. At Oregon, and your head coach is the one screwing it up. All those guys were good everywhere else. The only thing that's different about this staff is the head coach has never been a head coach before, and he's showing you why he probably just isn't ready to learn a good lesson to go back and be a DC, maybe a head coach in five years, but another three and eight or three and nine next year, four and eight. Ah, good luck. This has been, it always will be. Thanks for making it your first listen every single day. Locked on. No say grande.